Good morning. Uh, for those Game of Thrones fans in the audience, this is an intentional placement on set. Um, can we give a round of applause to the fantastic organizers of this event? What an incredible job they've done. And for everyone you see on stage, there's dozens behind the scenes that are making all of this possible. So, I'm Brian McCarson. Uh, I'm here today to have a conversation with you about a concept, but I'm only a representative of some much more brilliant minds that have put this concept together. And many people who worked to create this story I'm about to tell you today, in particular, Krishma Hegdi and Eve Schuler are two of my esteemed colleagues who were instrumental in the content preparation for what you're gonna see today. But before we get in, I have some good news and some not so good news. Good news is I'm not here to give you a product pitch. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to tell you why our widgets are better than someone else's widgets. I'm here to have a conversation. I'm here to talk about this concept of interoperability and describe a blueprint, a treasure map, an idea of how we can achieve something if we work together in a different way, and if we extend some already existing activities that are happening in the ecosystem. The not so good news is you have to start this presentation with a legal disclaimer, and there's nothing people like to do more when they're nursing a red wine headache from the night before and having to go through that. So what we're gonna talk about is this concept of rational interoperability. And I put the IR in front of this because in some cases, it feels like we have an irrational approach to how we're trying to solve some of these problems. So when we talk about this, what do we mean? Well, we're in this world where IoT is fueling a data-centric transformation. Previously, the cost of compute was so expensive that we were limited in the architectural frameworks that we could use to go deploy solutions in any market segment. And when you're in those scenarios, you're often constrained by cost as to what are the appropriate ways you can stitch devices together and connect them to the services that you want to apply or the analytics that are needed. And we've all seen these concepts about explosions of data and the number of devices that are growing at phenomenal rates. But we're at a time where we can now have a data-centric transformation instead of a compute-centric transformation. We live in a world today where it costs more to grow a single grain of rice than it does to produce a transistor that can switch on and off you know, a couple billion times a second. That enables us to place compute in places that we weren't able to before, and now we can start to make data-centric choices. We can start thinking about where should the data reside, where should the analytics occur, and we have the freedom now to go deploy that compute in a whole variety of ways that were just impossible previously. And as part of this, there's an emerging need for edge compute. Different people have different definitions of edge. I'm not proclaiming that this is the correct definition, but for the purposes of our conversation today, I like to define edge as where the things reside. Clearly though, in the cloud, there's an edge of the cloud and then there's a network and an edge of a network. And as you move from a wide area network to local area networks, there's edges of that as well. But there's some drivers for why edge compute is starting to make more sense. And data is one of those. There's a few scenarios where in segments like the ones I work in, I, I work in the industrial segment within Intel's Internet of Things group, where you've got some constraints that force you to place compute in certain locations. There are some factories in the world that aren't interested in having any of their proprietary data ever leave their property, no matter how much they trust their cloud service provider. And they'll set up their own private networks and never give anybody access to that. 
that's more economical to them than the risk of losing what's uniquely theirs, that their company's differentiating IP. There's latency concerns as well. Bandwidth cost, bandwidth concerns. We're seeing an explosion of cameras showing up in places we never would have imagined before, but those can really clog up networks if you don't manage things properly. And sending all of the data streaming in high definition from every smart camera on the planet directly to the cloud, it's probably not gonna be the most economical from a network perspective. There may be other advantages, but that's gonna create some challenges. And of course, connectivity concerns are part of that as well. But the one thing that I, I talk about with people, I, I'm not advocating that one architecture is right or wrong. I'm not saying that all your compute needs to be at the edge or all your compute needs to be in the cloud. I actually prefer heterogeneous structures that in some cases can be dynamic, where the same architecture can place different applications in different locations across that system. But there's some areas where you just don't have a choice. There's a speed limit that we have to deal with. So the speed of light in a vacuum is pretty high. You talk about you know, 670 million miles per hour. Um, we're not really used to being constrained too much by the speed of light. And all of our networks, of course, use optical transmission uh, to move data packets from one location to another. But we're, we're seeing an emergence of use cases that are requiring low double digit or even single digit latencies. Sorry, single digit microsecond latencies. So even at the speed of light, a photon only goes about a kilometer in a microsecond. So if you're trying to close the loop on decision making within microseconds of latency, you don't have an option unless you have access to wormholes or something. You're going to have to apply an edge compute paradigm in your system architecture. So why is interoperability important? I, I like to ask myself questions. Can we live in a world where all devices can communicate with one another? The promise of ambient AI, ambient artificial intelligence, is that the things in our world can start to become more intelligent, and they can start to self-discover, start to communicate with one another without necessarily having to have hard-coded applications that are stitching these devices together for their functionality. But I'm challenged with something. I have a cognitive dissonance. I have a little angel on my shoulder and a devil on my shoulder that are complaining back and forth and debating with each other. How much interoperability do we really need? Does my smoke detector in my house need to be able to communicate with a Boeing 777. It sounds like that would be a cool world, but why? Why do I need that? Would I like my smoke detector to talk to any Wi-Fi hubs in my house, maybe connect with all the devices that are on my private network, maybe communicate with thermostats, communicate with public safety? Now I'm talking about something that's really interesting. So are we going to try to tackle these interoperability challenges in a rational way or in an irrational way? I would like to, in my lifetime, see an ambient AI be applied in many different market segments and do it in an ethical way. But I'm concerned that if we try to bite off way too much in an interoperability story, that we may put ourselves in a situation where we're just trying to do way too much. We're being irrational about that. Now, when you look at this diagram, this mess of wires that we have, there's some areas that get me so excited about innovations that are happening today in this planet, where you've got manufacturing sectors that are communicating directly with logistics sectors, that are communicating directly with retail distribution centers and with consumers that whole supply chain of how everything that you're holding in your hand, your lanyard, your laptops, the clothes you're wearing, these are all manufactured. We're all surrounded by manufactured goods, but we don't necessarily have a great interoperable ecosystem to manage those as efficiently as possible. And if you look at environmental implications of the carbon footprint on our planet, 
there's no debate, regardless of what side of the, the coin you're on in terms of your own viewpoints, there's no debate that there's a huge energy impact with our manufacturing sector. So driving efficiencies there could have many positive implications. One example, uh, some of you may be familiar with Jack Ma. He's the founder of a huge cloud service provider called Alibaba, based out of China. And he has this vision that he's created where a consumer who wants a product can work directly with the manufacturer and create a C to F consumer to factory marketplace. Much how if you look at some of the, the dot com area innovations like eBay, where you're creating a platform where humans can start to distribute things beyond a garage sale type approach that you had to use in the past. This whole idea of a marketplace of, of connecting individuals to factories directly can produce a lot of very interesting results. The economics of some of this can be fantastic, both for the consumer and the factory. It can drive improved margins. It can drive custom-ordered products directly to your door and save a lot of additional costs along the way. But that's not going to happen without a significant degree of interoperability. And I, I believe the latest numbers is there's, uh, I, I think Alibaba announced they have 70,000 factories now on their network where you can buy anything from clothing to household items directly from a factory and have it delivered to your door in seven days after you place the order. There's other areas where clearly interoperability makes a lot of sense for us. The healthcare sector and the public sector, having that sort of interoperability is going to be critical for better patient outcomes and a more efficient healthcare system. So when we talk about this concept of rational interoperability. It's not a product. It's not me advocating for my standard or someone else's standard. It's a point of conversation. It's a way that maybe we can start to use a taxonomy and a way of describing our work in a way that can help us move that ball forward towards a better world. Now, to do this, you have to have technologies, standards, and initiatives Open source software is going to be key. But can you ask yourself the question, what level of interoperability is good enough for the market that I'm in? And can I go do something transformational in a rational, measured approach? And perfection shouldn't be the enemy of good. Trying to achieve one standard to rule them all is not something I think is going to happen in my lifetime, or any of yours. I'm probably older than a lot of you in here. Um, so let's talk about the industrial scenario. So again, I'm going to go back to my roots. I've been spending the last couple of decades in factories thinking about these automation methods and systems. When you think about interoperability on a factory floor, you have to think about the different hierarchical structure of how devices communicate with one another. There's going to be device-to-device -device interoperability, where you've got a robot talking to a robot. You're going to have cross-domain interoperability where an external camera that's aware of when humans are coming into that environment is able to communicate with these robots. So that cross-domain level of interoperability that's needed as well. So these robots can become more ambient aware and they can start to protect the humans around them. But then there's also an additional tier where you have an entire factory floor and all the equipment that's running and the execution systems on that factory and the WIP management or inventory management systems on those factories all need to be able to interoperate. So when you think about interoperability, it's not just about what is the one language that you need to use, but it's more of if you're thinking about a data-centric transformation, think about where is the data going to be moving and what decisions do you want to make with that data. So there's some building blocks. Metadata is not a really exciting term. And if you were to ask, I don't know, 100 technologists what metadata is, you might get a lot of different interpretations and a lot of people scratching their heads saying, I'm not really sure, but we're all actually very intimately familiar with metadata. If you go to LinkedIn, I have metadata. Brian's metadata talks about my name, 
You can even see a picture of what I look like. That's associated with my own individual profile. You can search by where I went to school. That's indexed in my metadata, what my title is, what city I work in. Imagine how useless an application like LinkedIn would be if there wasn't that metadata associations. How would you actually search a database if you had to just comb through each individual line of data to try to find something that was relevant? Metadata is a way that we organize things. Now, one of the things that I've heard in this conference is people talking about, I've got too much data. I've got so much data flooding into my cloud, and I don't really know how to use it. And the way I think about a lot of our IT systems, maybe it's not a fair analogy, but I think there's like a Discovery Channel program about hoarders, right? And it just feels like we're doing this in our data centers. Just, I don't know what that is, but just put it in the data center. Let's just store it. Let's throw it somewhere. Can I ever make sense of it? Well, if, if it's not cleansed well, if the data isn't filtered, if there's no context around that, if there's no metadata associated with the objects that are speaking, it's very hard for me to extract any significant value out of that. So when we're talking about interoperability and this concept of rational interoperability, a key step in us achieving this new vision is making sure that we have smart objects and we're paying attention to the metadata. So having everything as an object that has a unique digital ID, where devices, data, metadata, and the code associated with that, these are all contained within these things. That enables microservices to occur at the data level that otherwise you just simply can't, you can't take care of. If you're throwing everything to a cloud and hoping someone will be able to cleanse the data and try to make sense out of it. And metadata can be used to richly describe objects. It can give you information about the interfaces, the connectivity, the comms that they're deploying. It can give you an idea of what models are they using? What languages are they speaking? There's a reality that I face in the industrial segment where there's over 100 different languages that industrial devices speak. So having interoperability of all these devices from device to device, cross domain, this is a pretty significant challenge for a lot of the market segments that we face. So smart objects and metadata underpin interoperability and they enable additional microservices. So this is a way that we can bridge the cyber and the physical. In this, this treasure map, this blueprint that I'm describing, this is one of the key bridges. So it enables self-description. And self-description simplifies application development. If you think about recruiting technology right now in the, in the human resources domain, how much more enabled is that because of microservices that are available in applications like LinkedIn, where you can easily filter and get access to things? We need to be thinking about not only these large social media type applications and the metadata associated with it, but the individual devices as well. And smart objects and metadata can enable key IoT edge services. This can allow you to build data-centric pipelines and allow you to establish what I describe as trust anchors, where you can decide where is the most trustworthy point in your system architecture and start to associate all the objects and their metadata to that trust anchor. And that trust anchor can then be the way that you establish an efficient security profile wherever the data needs to be in that system architecture. But you're not going to get that without standards. Standards are absolutely key, as are some of the consortia that help shape them in order for us to achieve that. So application development can be vastly simplified if we take this approach. Now, when we talk about standards, I think we've all experienced this. Someone wakes up and realizes there's 14 competing standards in this area. We've got to fix this. Let's go develop one universal standard to rule them all. And tomorrow, what do you have? Now you have 15 competing standards. And as we sit here today, I can assure you, someone woke up this morning and is like, I'm going to fix this. 
yep, I'm going to go find that one standard to rule them all. And they're going to compete with other things that are in the marketplace. What I think is more important is that rational consolidation of standards. If you look at the IoT standards landscape, and you break it out by some of these different sectors that we all associate our businesses with, you can see there's a tremendous amount of activity going on in the standards and consortia world. Is it feasible that we're going to get all these communities and all these individuals aligned on just one framework? I don't think so. I don't think so. And by the way, this isn't a comprehensive list. This is just a list of the ones that I happen to be familiar with and some of the largest that exist in the ecosystem. But I can assure you by the end of the year, this list is going to be obsolete. But we're starting to see some of that rational convergence. Some of what's listed here is a combination of standards and consortia, which serve an important role. And this page is not an advocacy on my part of saying, these are the ones I endorse. I'm rather just stating this as an observation of where these natural coalescences are starting to happen in the ecosystem. And some of these groups are starting to see that there's much more power of them joining forces and creating interoperability within their standards rather than continuing to go after it alone and just try to fight for one that's better than the other. And this is already happening, and I think we should encourage this. This helps all of us. So let's talk about the solution timeline. Where are we today? What can we expect to happen in the medium term? And what, what are we trying to get to? Where's the X on the end of that treasure map? So in the near term, we're starting to see some of that consolidation of standards occurring today, as was just described in the previous slide. But there's still now an emergence of more and more open source technologies that are coming onto the market that are based on some of these standards. And this concept of having communities of developers that are creating code that allows you to go utilize these different objects based on these standards, I think is a very interesting emerging approach that's happening. And more and more people are talking about this discoverability aspect. This concept of how do I have my device be self-discoverable my, in my ecosystem, in my system architecture. So this is happening today. In the medium term, I'm starting to see more and more companies and businesses think about a dynamic edge to cloud, heterogeneous architecture, where some applications in the business can be cloud-centric, others can be edge-centric and they might even change over time as different applications and services are able to be deployed. This is happening in some of the uh, leading companies that are driving the industry 4.0 transformation, but we're even seeing some of this emerge in the manufacturing sector, in some of the uh, older technological manufacturing groups that exist in the planet. More and more data-centric networks will occur, where the decision about how your data is processed is less of a hoarder's approach, where just cram it all into one storage device, but rather it's an organized way. Data is generated using metadata, where objects are describing themselves as they generate data, and it's allowing us to have context. When you have context in data, you can turn that into valuable information. And this concept of trust anchors, can I have a trust anchor in the cloud? Can I have a trust anchor in the edge? And as long as my trust anchors are secure, we allow those trust anchors to be able to go distribute the levels of trust that are necessary for application beyond that. Long term, this concept of ambient computing, this idea where devices in our environment can start to learn, they can start to improve, they can teach themselves how to deliver additional capabilities and value to end users. And these concepts of ethical computing and truly thoughtful AI. If you go plug a device to the internet and expect something amazing to come out of that just because you have an AI application, 
It's not very realistic because so much of what's stored just lacks context. But we have the opportunity now in the long term to move towards that if we think about these concepts of rational interoperability and we start finding pockets in the market where it really makes sense. So final thoughts. Here we are in Vegas. So the roulette image seems to make a lot of sense. Again, I'm not advocating that one standard or consortia is better than the other. There's a lot to choose from. My advocacy is place your bets well. You can't be in everything. You can't adopt every standard. So try to bet rationally. Find the ones that are thinking about trust anchors. They're thinking about device discoverability. They're thinking about how you assign metadata in a way that allows other objects to provide context. Think about those standards that are looking not just at a compute architecture, where's the most cost-effective way for me to land my compute, or just something that's restricted to their particular business model, but think about those standards that are really looking at heterogeneous networks and trying to let the data guide the system architecture. So if you want to know more, you can connect with us. There's a paper called Rational Interoperability that a number of my esteemed colleagues that are much more intelligent than I am constructed. And I'm hopeful that you'll explore these topics. And as you're having conversations about your business, start to think about some of these key elements and how these efforts that we're engaging in now can help be the dawn of a new era of ambient computing. Thank you.